So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Luis Santos and I'm currently a scientist uh, working on drug delivery and nanomedicine at AstraZeneca. And I'm also an industrial board member of the nanomedicine and nanoscale delivery group within the Control Release Society. Uh, on behalf of the uh, group, I would like to welcome you all to our first uh, webinar of 2020. Uh, and on the topic of fluid nanoparticle technology enabling nucleic acid therapeutics by Professor Roy van der Meel. And I just want to let you know that the webinar will have a duration of about one hour with 40 to 45 minute presentation by Professor Roy followed by a 15 to 20 minute uh, for Q&A uh, session. Please make sure that you send your questions through the chat room and I will ensure that we will address uh, all of the questions at uh, time allowing. Just a brief introduction on uh, Professor Roy. Professor Roy uh, has obtained his PhD at Utrecht University uh, under, uh, under the direction of uh, Gert Storm and uh, Wim um, Henning. Um, he then conducted his postdoctoral studies in the labs of uh, Raymond at the University of Medical Center of Utrecht and Peter Collis at the University of British Columbia, uh, funded by uh, Mary Curry uh, action from the European Commission and a grant, a any grant from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. Professor Roy is currently appointed as an assistant professor at the Eindhoven University of Technology Biomedical Engineering Department, where he currently heads the Precision Medicine Group under the direction of Willem uh, Mulder. His group uh, research uh, is focused on developing nanotherapeutics to regulate the innate immune response in a highly precision. Um, an effective manner. Roy, the stage is yours. Thanks, uh, Luis. That's a, a nice and elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, I, I'm not a professor yet, although it, it sounds good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm I'm in, in in Eindhoven, which is in the south of the Netherlands. So I think good morning to everyone uh, on the west coast. Good afternoon to everyone on the east coast, and and good evening to everyone in in Europe. And um, like Luis mentioned, I uh, I I I am from the Netherlands, and I did my PhD there. Uh, since one year now, I'm back here, uh, heading uh, my own research group. And before that, I spent some time in the in in the lovely uh, Vancouver on the west coast of Canada and Peter Collis's group, uh, where I learned a thing or two about uh, lipid nanoparticle technology and how it's enabling uh, nucleic acid therapeutics. Um, just of note, that I know that two people, uh, very knowledgeable people from the Colors Lab, have joined. So, um, if you have any questions, like Louis said, you can type them in the chat box. And even maybe during the talk, uh, both Dominic Witzigman uh, and and Jayesko Carney have joined. They may be already be able to answer your your questions uh, while I'm doing this talk. And otherwise, we'll keep the the, the, the questions for afterwards. So, uh, I want to thank uh, the focus group. Uh, of the CRS for inviting me to uh, to provide this webinar. Of course, uh, Xiao for setting this up and, and Luis for moderating. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I, I would say let's, if we can get the show on the road, right? If we can get a... All right. So just a quick overview of, of what I'll be talking about in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, first, a little bit of background on, on uh, cRNA, RNAi, um, and why it's important that we, you know, need to have these uh, delivery systems for these types of molecules. Uh, I'll go into the, uh, to the components of LMPs, uh, specifically, of course, the uh, ionized bouquetti on the clipids and their development, how they have enabled the, the clinical translation of these types of systems and uh, um, sRNA therapeutics. Um, I'll briefly touch upon uh, production methods, which have also played a role um, in uh, facilitating 
clinical translation and approval of the first sRNA drug. And if we have enough time, then talk briefly about the beyond the state of the art. So um, delivery of, for example, mRNA or gene editing complexes, uh, where LMPs are, are very suitable for as well, of course. So um, let's start with a little bit of, uh, of background on siRNA and, and uh, RNA interference. Um, I'm pretty sure I don't really have to explain um, to people what RNA interference is uh, and how you can use siRNA uh, to silence specific genes, but maybe of important to know that only 20 years ago, RNA interference was discovered by uh, Andrew Fire and Craig Mello, who were awarded the, uh, the Nobel Prize for this in, in, in 2006. Um, here in short, the RNAi or the RNA interference mechanism, um, with the idea of course being, or as you mo most of you will know that the introduction of, of short interfering RNA um, into cells um, can lead to the specific uh, cleavage and degradation um, of a target mRNA. So you can use this for um, uh, development of genetic drugs without interfering with, uh, with the DNA. To give some background on, uh, on ATTR amyloidosis, um, this is the disease for which Onpetro is now approved for. And Onpetro is the first siRNA drug. Um, mostly uh, mediated by um, lipid nanoparticle technology. Uh, so the disease, um, so uh, hereditary ATTR amyloidosis, is caused by uh, a genetic mutation um, that prevents the, the um, ETR protein, um, which is made in the liver, uh, from performing its normal function. So normally it's a, it's a transport protein of a, a thyroid hormone and, and retinol. And what happens is that um, these, these uh, ETR uh, monomers, they, they misfold um, and they accumulate as amyloid deposits in the body, in the heart, in the nerves, um, and as well as other organs, causing, of course, a lot of a lot of symptoms. There's about an estimated 50,000 patients worldwide. Um, and the, uh, the big issue for the, uh, or, or the big challenge for these patients is, is that they, uh, until now, did not really have a lot of other treatment options, um, apart from drugs that stabilize uh, ETR, uh, a liver transplant, and since last year, also an, an antisense oligonucleotide. Um, but this is, this is quite a bad disease, um, and ultimately fatal. Um, and now because we have on Petro, um, we actually have a treatment for this. So, um, I think most of you will know as well that, that on Petro was approved in, in, in 2018 and is the first ever siRNA drug that, that reached the clinic. So this was a big success. Um, and, um, I guess what you will also know is that this drug is uh, mostly facilitate, facilitated by the uh, lipid nanoparticle technology, which you see here, um, which originated from uh, Peter Collins' lab at, at UBC in Vancouver. So what does Ompetro do? Um, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Ompetro is a lipid nanoparticle containing sRNA against the uh, TTR gene. Um, so it's injected or infused intravenously and transfects hepatocytes in the liver, uh, which are responsible for protein production. And um, the sRNA, of course, um, inhibits the production of the mutant protein um, and thereby the, the fibro formation of these, uh, these patients. Um, so here you see how these particles look like under an electron microscope, and this is a scale bar of about 15 nanometers. So we're talking about 15 nanometer protein, uh, sorry, 15 nanometer uh, nanoparticles. And on the right side, you see some of the uh, uh, results from the phase three 
clinical trial on the basis of which Ompetro was approved. So um, on the um, on the y-axis here, you see a score that is a, a neuro neuropathy uh, impairment score. So it's a standardized quantitative methods to measure, for example, muscle weakness, uh, muscle stretch reflexes, sensory loss, um, and autonomic impairment with higher scores corresponding to disease worsening. Um, so you see over a, uh, on the, on the x-axis over a course of, of nine months, uh, patients that got either a placebo treatment or uh, Tisseran or on Patro, uh, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks over 18 months. See yeah, that in the placebo group, disease progressively worsened. Um, and in the treatment group, not only did the disease stabilize, but for uh, a subgroup of patients, um, uh, their condition actually uh, got better, um, which is a huge thing uh, for these patients. So um, just to show right from the, from, from the start that um, LMP technology is very powerful and very potent um, in, in delivering siRNA in, in parasites and, and, and silencing uh, genes in those cells. So why do we need um, lipid nanoparticle technology? Why do we need nano carrier technology or delivery technology anyway? Well, if you look at uh, siRNA, uh, short or small interfering RNA, um, there's, a, there's a few things that, that, that um, or a few aspects or a few features that sets them apart from small molecules. Um, and of course, this has to do with their uh, uh, relatively large size compared to small uh, molecules, but also their, that they are heavily and negatively charged. And um, this brings, of course, um, some issues uh, for using these uh, molecules as, as therapeutics. Um, I think most of you will be aware of um, if you inject or if you if you administer these types of molecules into the bloodstream um, of, of, of lab animals or patients, um, these molecules get immediately either filtered out or they degrade in the bloodstream because of, uh, of RNases and they get taken up by, by phagocytic cells. Um, so, by using some of this, uh, by using carrier and nano carrier technology, you protect the uh, therapeutic payload uh, from this degradation. Uh, at the same time, because of the, heav heav uh, of the heavily negative charged uh, molecules, they're unable to uh, pass membranes, um, which of course most small molecules are, are able to do. This poses a big problem, of course, because the RNAi machinery is in the in the cytosol of the cells. So not only do you have to make sure that your uh, therapeutic siRNA molecule comes out of the circulation, is um, reaches the uh, right type of cell, but also once it's been taken up by the cell, which usually happens uh, by endocytosis, then it actually comes comes out of the endosome uh, and reaches uh, the cytosol, and um, until now, the endosomal escape is, is or has proven to be one of the, the, the major bottlenecks um, for these uh, types of therapies. So let's get into the uh, components of the lipid nanoparticle. Um, there are actually quite a few nano carriers that we consider lipid nanoparticles, and there's uh, three in the screen here. So um, let's say in the, in the middle, um, you have your classical liposome, uh, traditional liposomes that consist of a, a, a lipid bilayer surrounding an aqueous core. And, and these systems can be used for um, an entrapment of, let's say, water-soluble molecules. Um, on the left, you have a, a lipid emulsion type of nanoparticle. So it's a hydrophobic core encased by a, a lipid monolayer, and these systems can be used to entrap um, hydrophobic molecules. 
and on the right side, uh, uh, and also uh, behind me, yeah. you get the uh, beautiful rendition of a of a, a, a lipid nanoparticle containing sRNA molecules, which was not drawn by me but by Jay. So I'm not taking the credits for this. Um, if you put these types of systems under a microscope, they look like this. So the the the, the classic liposomes you can see. Um, the electron dense lipid bilayer surrounding the lipid, uh, sorry, surrounding an aqueous core. And you see that the um, uh, lipid nanoparticles containing nucleic acids have a more electron dense core. Um, and if you load standard liposomes with uh, chemotherapeutics that, such as doxorubicin, um, that precipitate as a salt, uh, salt crystals inside liposomes, you get the uh, distinct coffee bean shape. So under a microscope, these systems are uh, quite distinct. Let's focus a little bit on the, um, on the specific components of the lipid nanoparticles for sRNA delivery. Um, basically, we have a, a, a modular delivery platform that contains of four main components. Um, there's the uh, phospholipid component and the cholesterol component. Um, cholesterol mainly for stability of the particle. There's, of course, the, um, the PEC lipid, the shield uh, uh, charges or charge charge interactions. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further on in the, in the presentation. Um, these PEC lipids are mainly there make sure that these particles do not aggregate during storage uh, before administration. Um, the most important uh, component of the, of the LMPs is, of course, the ionizable cationic uh, lipid. So together, um, these particles, um, or let's say together, these, these, these components make up particles that efficiently entrap nucleic acids uh, they have a neutral surface charge in the circulation, which is important for their circulation time. Um, and um, they are quite, or let's say, um, more efficient in uh, delivering their nucleic acid payload than if you would use systems that have a permanently charged electronic uh, lipid. So, why is the, the, the ionizable cationic lipid um, so important? So in, in, in isolation, cationic lipids and anionic lipids uh, present in the endosome, such as lysopis, uh, phosphatidic acid, they adopt a cylindrical shape, um, and that, that supports a, a bilayer structure. Of course, um, if you want to get out of the endosome, you have to disrupt uh, that bilayer structure. So when uh, cationic and anionic lipids are mixed together, uh, they combine to form ion pairs, adopting a, a molecular cone uh, shape, uh, which you see here on the right side. And um, promotion of, of inverted non bilayer phases uh, do not support bilayer structure. And um, they are associated with, with, with membrane fusion and membrane disruption. So the, the ionizable cationic lipid component actually has, um, has, has multiple functions. Um, at, at acidic pH, um, when you formulate LMPs, um, they become protonated, become charged, which of course uh, promotes the interaction with the negatively charged nucleic acid. Physiological pH, um, these lipids become uncharged. So you have a, uh, an LMP system with an overall uh, near net neutral charge, promoting their circulation time. Once it's been taken up by cells in the endosome, which have an acidic pH, um, this promotes the, the lipid promotes the, the endosomal escape. So three functions. Now, um, how did we go from um, you know, an 
1998, discovery of siRNA or the, the RNAi mechanism to 2006, the uh, Nobel Prize. Um, how do we go from lipids to I to permanently uh, permanently cationically charged lipids to ionizable cationic lipids? Um, basically, by by uh, large screens that optimized um, both the head group, um, the linker, um, and the lipid tail. Um, and the lipid tails are, of course, there uh, to increase the hydrophobicity. So there's good LMP incorporation. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, these protonated lipids, they generate structures that help elevate uh, uh, the membrane fusion in the acidified uh, liposomes. Uh, just um, on the left side, you see some of the ionizable cationic lipids that were developed in, uh, on the West Coast. So in, in, in Peter's lab and uh, with, with, with collaborators, of course, and on the right side, you see some of the uh, lipidoid structures uh, of which C12200 is the, possibly the most famous one and the most used and that were developed in, in, uh, in Dan Anderson's group on, uh, on the East Coast, of course. Um, both work um, very well and, and in, in, in the same manner. So they both contain tertiary amines that uh, become protonated depending on the, on the pH. Um, the deal in MC3 DMA or MC3 in short is the ionizable cationic lipid that is being used in the on petro formulation. Now, how did they come to, uh, to find out which, um, which ionizable cationic lipid was most, was most potent? Um, they set up a, um, a screen in mice um, where they um, made standard LMP. So the four components that we talked about before, uh, the cholesterol, a phospholipid, the SPC, um, a PEG lipid, and a uh, ionizable cationic lipid. And uh, these, these systems would bear um, siRNA against factor seven. So factor seven is, a, is, a, is of course, a coagulation factor. Um, that is being produced in hepatocytes. Um, and it has a very similar um, um, half-life as, as, as the TTR protein. This was a good candidate for screening which formulations would be most potent for, uh, for silencing uh, the TTR protein or the TTR gene. Uh, the screen is very simple. The, um, uh, the um, particles get injected intravenously and 24 hours later, uh, factor seven levels um, in the blood are determined. So um, in this plot on the left, you see um, levels of, of, uh, of factor seven um, in the blood. Um, and these are, uh, these are ED50 levels. So this is the effective dose uh, at which 50% of the um, uh, factor seven uh, cannot be detected; is not detected in the blood anymore. So it's a, a measure uh, to determine how potent these formulations are. And at the, um, here uh, at the x-axis, see the apparent pKa of the uh, formulations. Um, so you see that there is a um, optimum pKa um, where, let's say, between six point zero and 6.5, uh, which shows uh, which formulations are, are, are most potent or most effective in, in silencing this factor seven. And if you um, plot this in a different way, uh, where you show the, the uncharged um, ionizable cationic lipids, the charged uh, ionizable cationic lipid, um, and the ED50 for, for factor seven, um, you can see which, you can clearly see which formulation or which lipid um, is most potent and it turned out to be, uh, to be MC3. So this is um, plotted in, in, a, in a different way. If you remember when we um, showed the, uh, the different uh, lipid structures before, um, see that 
the first lipid that was ever tried to deal in depth. Um, you can see the dose on the, in the x-axis, how much sRNA had to be dosed to mice to um, limit or to effectively silence at least 50% of, of factor seven. Um, and if you can see that here, we're talking about roughly 10 milligrams per kilo. Uh, and MC3 in mice was able to do that at 0 0.03 milligrams per kilo. Um, so that's an, an improvement of more than three orders of magnitude with no increase in toxicity. Um, and this corresponds to a therapeutic index improvement greater than 8,000 fold. And this was, of course, very important uh, to be able to translate these, these particles to the clinic. Um, so with a very, very low uh, sRNA dose, uh, they were able to, uh, to effectively um, silence uh, factor 7 gene. Now, um, we also have, well, there's a lot of people working on, on next generation uh, ionizable cationic lipids. Uh, these have to do with the fact that we we're always looking for more potent lipids, but also um, have started to look a lot at the uh, at toxicity uh, related issues. So um, many of the uh, of the lipids that are, are used in the clinic, including MC3, um, depending on the dose that you give, they can still be toxicity related to their to their cation charge. So um, if you see in the top, um, this is a paper already from, from 2013, how MC3 was uh, redesigned um, to contain a, a biocleavable ester functions uh, within its hydrophobic alkyl change. And you get the, the lipid called L319, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is more biodegradable and doesn't uh, accumulate over time, in, for example, in hepatocytes. Um, and you can see in this graph, in this bar uh, diagram here, that it retains its, its, its potency. Um, and again, the, these are results from the factor seven uh, screening model. And what you can also see on the, on the right top here, um, you see that the, um, um, here you see L319, uh, which is not accumulating uh, in the liver. And, uh, a control lipid called L343, which does not have the um, biocleavable ester functions, uh, actually accumulates in the liver. Um, and in the bottom, you see that uh, L319 is actually effectively um, excreted from the body via the urine and the, and the feces. Now, there are a lot more people um, working uh, developing these type of lipids. So there's companies like, of course, Moderna uh, on the East Coast. There's Acutus, of course, spin out from the Collis lab. There's uh, Arcturus. Um, and there's a, there's a few companies in Europe as well, like um, Purevac um, and, and BioNTech that all have lipid libraries, um, which are already a lot more potent than uh, MC3, which is because it's clinically val validated, still the, um, the golden standard. But you see that most of these lipids all have uh, certain things in common. There, uh, there are amines there that can be uh, protonated, and there, uh, let's say, uh, biocleavable uh, groups on there. Now, so far, um, so we've been talking about the the ionizable cationic lipid, um, but another uh, important lipid in this formulation is actually the PEC lipid, um, and the reason for that is is uh, because it plays a big role in, in, in how efficiently uh, these systems can be taken up by hepatocytes. So it's kind of, um, for these, for these nanocarrier systems, there's of course a balance between um, how long do you want to circulate something and cover, and, and cover the surface of such a particle uh, with lots of pegylated uh, lipids. And uh, what does that do to your transfection efficiency? Well, I can tell you that if you take one of these LMP particles and you put something like DSP, uh, DSP-EPEG in there, 
we call a permanent uh, pack lipid, you dramatically reduce their efficacy. So the uh, pack lipid that uh, is incorporated in, 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 in Onpetro is pack DMG, which has a C14 alkyl chain, um, which remains in a particle when it's in buffer. So there's no aggregation of particles, but as soon as you uh, inject these particles, so in the presence of a lipid sink, um, the C14 pack lipid will, will rapidly uh, dissociate from the particle. Um, and what happens there is what you see here on this slide, particles get, or what is in, in theory what happens, uh, these particles get coated with APOE and uh, you get uh, APOE mediated uh, uptake in the pedicides. Um, followed by endosomal escape and, and of course, uh, gene silencing. So next to the ionizable cationic lipid, which is very important for encapsulation, uh, the charge uh, and endosomal escape, you have that pack lipid component, um, which is also very important um, in order for these, uh, these particles to, to actually be efficient. Now, um, there's a lot of people that, that when I talk about the APOE mediated uptake by these, by these particles that um, are, are not so convinced by that. Um, but there is actually some, uh, uh, some evidence for that. So if we look at the, the, the role of APOE and, and uh, the, the, uh, the role of the LDL receptor, so for APOE mediated uptake. Uh, if we look at some of the, uh, these results here, that's, that's already now already nine to 10 years old. Um, these are some of the experiments that were done in, in, uh, in knockout mice. And, and I'll, I'll quickly uh, take you through it. So um, here on the left, um, you see the expression levels. Um, um, you see both the, the, the levels of factor seven uh, mRNA levels in the liver. And in gray, you see a factor seven levels serum protein. Um, with PBS control in wild type mice, of course, these levels are normal. And you see that with, with uh, MC3 containing LMPs, there is a, a very um, potent reduction of both the mRNA levels and, and the serum protein. Now, if we take um, APOE knockout mice, um, we see that this effect, so the, the, the knockdown effect is completely abolished. Um, and it can be saved by actually um, adding uh, or exposing the LMPs to uh, APOE before uh, administration. So that provides some proof for the APOE uh, mediated or, or the APOE role. Um, an LMP uptake in the pesticides. And, and something similar um, can be seen in here on the right side. Um, if we compare the uh, serum uh, factor seven levels in wild type mice in black and in gray in uh, LDL receptor uh, knockout mice. So what happens here is that um, In wild type mice, depending on the dose, you see a dramatic or a very potent knockdown uh, factor seven, depending on the dose. Um, and this is actually a lot less pronounced in the LDL uh, receptor knockout mice. So this provides some evidence for the role of the, uh, the LDL receptor. Let's quickly touch upon uh, production methods. Um, as I mentioned before, production methods or the, the improvement of production methods has, has also played a role in, in um, these types of four component nanoparticles with, with a nucleic acid payload and in translation into the clinic. So uh, this is how we, or how we, or how people uh, used to make uh, lipid nanoparticles. Um, in the, in the old days, uh, we still use it in the lab because this is uh, what you see here is an extruder. And what you see here is a, in the middle is a very young Peter Cullis 
uh, without safety goggles, which I do not recommend if you use an extruder. Uh, extruders work, of course, um, when you, where you put your lipids, um, uh, when you rehydrate a lipid film, you put that solution uh, under pressure through, um, uh, through a membrane with a certain cutoff, and you can very much um, get a very homogeneous uh, lipid nanoparticle solution. Um, today, um, I think we usually most these for, uh, for very efficient book stands. We've switched to, um, let's say, rapid mixing methods. Um, the, the big advantages of, of rapid mixing methods, one, it's a lot faster, and two, you can easily adjust um, components with, which dictate the size uh, and, and other uh, LMP parameters. Uh, for people who are not familiar with this, um, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, you have um, a microfluidic chip with two inlets. Um, one is used for the aqueous stream, um, so the sRNA and buffer, and that's at a low pH to, um, to generate, of course, the um, the charge-charge interaction between the uh, ionized bulkettium lipid and the sRNA. And the other has the uh, ethanol stream containing all the, uh, the lipids or lipid components. Um, and by rapidly mixing both of them together, uh, you generate these, uh, these nanoparticles. Um, and this is something that's now, uh, of course, marketed by uh, precision nanosystems. Um, what we actually use quite often in the lab is a very simple T-junction mixture, which works in the exact same way. Uh, so again, uh, we have lipids in the organic phase and, and sRNA in, in buffer pH4. We make them, um, well, we rapidly mix them together. And they form uh, nanoparticles uh, through the mechanism, which, which is shown below, um, which we, what we think is happening. Um, and um, there is also some evidence for that, which, which Jay published um, one and a half year ago. So um, what you see here is, um, let's say, electron uh, microscopy images of, of lipid nanoparticles with, with a different N over P ratio. So N over P ratio is the, the, the ratio of um, positive charges of the cationic lipid versus the, the negative charges of the, uh, the sRNA. And what you can see that in N over P ratios of three and six, which are typically used um, in, in, in the clinic as well, um, at pH four, um, so straight after mixing, these particles are, are, are really small. So let's focus on the, the N over P of three. Um, the step that happens afterwards, after formulating, is that um, we dialyze these particles overnight. Um, so you change the uh, dialyze against PBS. So there's a there's a pH change from four to uh, to physiological pH, um, which induces the diffusion of these smaller particles to uh, to bigger particles. Um, and that's why we think this is the current working model of uh, or, the, or the current theory how these particles are formed uh, during uh, rapid mixing and uh, dialysis after. So in the last uh, five or six minutes or so, or so, I want to give you some examples of how uh, lipid nanoparticle technology can now also be, or is now also being used uh, for the production of other types of uh, nucleic acid-based therapeutics. So for example, messenger RNA, or even uh, delivery of, of gene editing complexes. Um, so with mRNA, of course, rather than uh, using sRNA to silence something, mRNA you can, of course, use uh, to produce therapeutic proteins. I'm sure I don't have to, uh, to explain this to you, but if you can uh, deliver mRNA encoding a therapeutic protein uh, efficiently into a cell, that protein will, of course, be produced, uh, again, without interfering with the, uh, with the DNA. Um, and, and one of the examples of this is... Uh, for example, the production of, of therapeutic proteins. Um, the idea being quite simple, these, these uh, 
this is a study done by uh, that was that was um, published by Acutis. They take these lipid nanoparticles uh, containing mRNA encoding uh, for an anti-HIV uh, antibody, um, using the, the liver as a bioreactor to basically produce these therapeutic proteins. Um, and what you can see um, in, the, in this graph here is um, that by uh, injecting mice intravenously um, with these types of lipid nanoparticles, um, there's very uh, good production um, of this anti-HIV protein or this anti-HIV um, antibody. And more importantly, um, if you challenge these um, uh, Challenge these mice with the virus, um, the pretreatment with these lipid nanoparticles and the production and the resulting production of the, of the, uh, the therapeutic antibody actually prevents uh, or protects them from the viral challenge. Um, another uh, thing that you can do with mRNA is, of course, um, if you design your mRNAs to encode for uh, an antigen. You can think of, of uh, mRNA-based uh, vaccinations. Um, and here's an example of an, an LMP mRNA uh, Zika virus vaccination uh, that was done in both mice and, and non-human primates. Um, and again, rather than um, um, using the liver as a bioreactor, so you do an intravenous injection, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, uh, these um, strategies are usually aimed at um, delivering mRNA encoding for antigens to antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells or, or other uh, phagocytic cells. So they can also be uh, administered um, um, intradermally, which is the case um, in this study here. So basically, um, uh, non-human primates that were uh, injected with, with uh, Lipid nanoparticles containing uh, messenger RNA encoding for uh, Zika virus capsid uh, proteins uh, completely. Uh, this, this resulted in complete um, uh, protection from, from viral challenge uh, at five weeks. So, in the last um, example um, of mRNA vaccination, um, is, is what, I what I find super interesting. Um, is the, uh, the potential to, to create truly personalized and, and patient-specific cancer vaccine. Um, how this works is that um, if, if there is a patient with a tumor, you can take a, a tumor biopsy and you can take a biopsy from or cells um, from, from healthy tissue, um, sequence them both, and look for distinctions uh, or distinct uh, mutations that are that are caused by uh, the cancer and of course um, those mutations you can create uh, mRNAs for that encode for these uh, mutated proteins and use that to uh, uh, or encapsulate those those mRNAs in the, in the lipid nanoparticle and administer it to the same patients and in that way you get a, a patient specific anti-cancer vaccine um, and those those approaches are are, are currently being pursued by uh, by Moderna and, and BioNTech, and and here are some results uh, from BioNTech uh, in mice. So very simple, uh, B sixteen uh, melanoma mice, um, sequencing on both the tumor cells and healthy tissue from these mice, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the differences, um, and immunize these mice with uh, the RNAs that. Um, were generated based on the on the on the tumor specific mutations, and if we look on the on the on the right side, you see that the um, let's say the the B sixteen and thirty vaccine treatment um, very capable of uh, completely eliminating tumors in these mice, um, and especially in, in in combination with certain antibodies, also prolonging the the survival of these mice. Um, and similar results were obtained when they used, or, or, or when they, um, rather than a subcutaneous model, 
inject these tumor cells uh, IV, you get a metastasis model, and they saw similar effects. So this can be quite, quite potent. Now, the last thing before, uh, before we can do some Q&A um, is to show you that uh, lipid nanoparticle technology is now also being used to deliver uh, gene editing complexes. Uh, and of course, with the idea to uh, correct disease-causing uh, mutated genes. Um, and one example of that is from, from Intellia Therapeutics. Uh, so what they did is basically encapsulate um, an mRNA encoding for the Cas9 protein um, and a short guide RNA against uh, TTR. And what you see here on the left, um, when they inject um, a reasonably high dose uh, in mice, they get up to 70% of, uh, of liver editing sustained, which also leads to a complete uh, or completely abolishes the, the serum TTR levels. And in the bottom, you can see a staining for TTR. You see that, that uh, even after one year that the, uh, the levels of, of, of TTR are, uh, are completely suppressed. Now, the last thing um, that I want to talk about is because not a lot of um, attention is given to this, but um, injecting nanocarrier system containing nucleic acid payloads will lead to certain adverse effects. These can be uh, infusion-related effects, but also effects that have to do because of the, the cationic nature of, of the lipids. Uh, and of course, the, the, the nucleic acid payloads that can cause um, um, immunological um, adverse effects. So an example of a study done by Sam Chen, who also graduated from the college lab, if you inject PBS in mice um, behind the shoulder blades, um, the mice can handle that quite well. But you can see the difference if you inject uh, a lipid nanoparticle containing siRNA. Uh, and if you look at the uh, immunohistochemistry of it, you see an influx of a lot of immune cells. Um, therefore, for example, on Petro is giving with uh, his. his um, uh, patients that receive on petro treatment get predosed with a combination of, for example, corticosteroids, dexamethasone, um, to reduce some of these uh, infusion-related effects. Um, so what um, Sam actually did is developed, rather than giving uh, a combination treatment of lipid nanoparticles containing nucleic acid therapeutics, pre-dexamethasone, created dexamethasone prodrugs which stably in incorporate in, uh, in lipid nanoparticles. You can already see from the bottom that uh, this, this um, significantly reduces the, uh, the side effects of these, uh, of these, of these treatments. Um, what you can see here in the bottom is that um, incorporation of these prodrugs does not reduce the potency or the, the ability of these uh, particles to induce gene silencing. What you can see here in the top is that um, different types of, of uh, immunostimulatory nucleic acid payloads um, incorporating um, the prodrug in these particles very much um, reduces these immunostimulatory effects. So and with that, I think um, I've taken enough of your time and um, some things to take home. Um, nucleic acid-based therapeutics, they either require or both require chemical modifications like uh, so, which is common for, for antisense uh, therapies, or they acquire some sort of delivery technology uh, like LMPs. Uh, for the LMP technology, the, the two important components are, the, of course, the ionizable cationic lipid and diffusible PEC lipid. Um, and um, for mRNA therapeutics, which will be, or which is already becoming the next big thing, um, You can use the liver as a biofactory for, for um, antigen and therapeutic protein production or deliver mRNA to, to uh, antigen presenting cells for processing and, and antigen uh, presentation. So before I leave, if you're interested in this, in this subject, um, uh, 
the other focus group of gene delivery and gene editing uh, will host a, a webinar on March 2nd on, on mRNA vaccines and therapeutics uh, by Ern Almerson from, from Moderna. So it should be very interesting. Um, for the people from Europe, um, in April, there will be a uh, nice meeting uh, on the, from the European Society of Control uh, Drug Police. And we'll host a satellite meeting uh, by the, by the, from the local CRS chapter uh, aimed at, at early career scientists. So if you uh, looking for a nice meeting to give a talk and, and, and meet fellow uh, uh, early career scientists, this is the place to go in Europe. And of course, um, got to mention this. Um, in the summer, of course, there's the main CRS meeting, which uh, I don't think I have to explain why you should attend this. It should be a really good meeting. Uh, thank you for your time. And um, please, if you have any questions, um, you can uh, ask me now or, or, or find me online. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roy, for uh, your inspirational and uh, very interesting talk and uh, on the um, lipid nanoparticles, uh, starting with the um, pathway example and ending up with the um, other uh, potential applications of lipid nanoparticles to uh, deliver mRNA and uh, uh, CRISPR uh, tools. Um, so I have received a couple of questions uh, through the chat room, and I think uh, let's get started with some of those. Uh, the first one is on the is related to Ompatru, and uh, the question is around why do you think Ompatru was successful? Is it there's a combination of the technology and the disease? Um, how does uh, the translation of Ompatru um, came along and from you know research to clinical trials and what were the challenges that were seen there yeah there's the, well there's a few things of course um i think there were there was a culmination of uh where 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 people saw look these these types of small nanocarriers often and often end up in the liver that was an observation Two, uh, following the discovery of, of RNAi and, and sRNA, um, people started to uh, adopt or uh, um, uh, alter uh, traditional uh, lipid nanoparticle systems like liposomes. They tried to adopt this for um, for delivery of these these types of nucleic acids, and of course they had already done this previously or, or attempted to do this for for plasmid DNA. Um, so th those were two developments that were were ongoing. Um, now, what turned out is that in the beginning, and even I did this when I was a student, you very much easily take a permanently charged cationic lipid like DOTAP, and you take something uh, negatively charged, nucleic acid, you put them together. In vitro, works great. Um, if you inject it um, in in uh, in animals or in, in patients, it, it doesn't work and it's it's too um, it's too toxic. Um, so there were all these observations, um, which I think culminated culminated into, uh, of course, going after. Um, I, I'm not saying it was a low hanging fruit, but it, it was logical to go after a liver target because that's where these types of particles uh, end up. Anyway, at the same time. Uh, going after an orphan disease, of course, gives you a lot of advantages in terms of um, regulations and, and, and FDA approval. Uh, so you can orphan status, uh, fast track, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, what what really made what really started making a big difference is that um, L nylon was very, I think, very persistent in in uh, um, in developing systems which um, of which they thought would be uh, would be very potent and efficient and they they basically work together with with that's why i showed these lipidoids as well they work together with uh, with dan anderson and uh, and of course peter collis this was all be before i was there um and there are some some papers from 2008 and 2010 and maybe a little bit later 
where they screened hundreds um, of these ionizable cationic lipids to find out which one was the most potent. Um, let's see. Uh, even even during the early preclinical pre development, uh, where they started with DLIN DAP, where they actually did the, the phase one trial first with. Um, they were still developing these ionizable cationic lipids, and not until they had found uh, MC3, they decided to change the formulation um, and go with that because it turned out to be so much more potent. So I think it was a combination of um, development of the ionizable cationic lipids, the development of diffusible PEC lipids, uh, and the, the notion that these particles very efficiently accumulate in the liver and um, and transfect hepatocytes. Um, so for me, I think it was logical that they went after a hepatocytic target. Um, Jay or or Dom, you have anything to add to that? Not sure if they're there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, maybe you mentioned like uh, sense oligonucleotide DNA at the beginning. Like one thing important to mention, like when the, the people started to develop lipid nanoproducts for nucleic acid, um, everything started with plasmid DNA and antisense oligos. But at that time, um, siRNA wasn't even yet discovered. So this is what what Roy mentioned in one of his first slides: the discovery of siRNA, um, and the uh, Nobel Prize along with this was a was a, another step for the development of a petrol. Yep. Very much agree. Did that did that answer most of the, the, the questions, Marcus? I believe so. Um, thank you both. Uh, and I think we still have three other minutes uh, that we can use. And uh, one of the other questions I have in the chat, and it's related really to the fact that these lipid nanoparticles do have you know an inherent ability to target the liver. Um, you know, people are wondering whether or not we can also use, you know, lipid nanoparticles to target other tissues, um, whether you go via IV administration or other uh, routes of administration. Yeah, um, very, very good question. And there's, there's definitely, uh, there's definitely uh, strategies to do so. So. The, the other administration route, which I, I briefly mentioned for the, the mRNA systems, uh, because they're so aimed at, um, you know, if you're going after vaccination purposes, you don't necessarily have to go for the intravenous route. You just need something to protect your payload uh, before, it's, um, before it reaches an, an antigen presenting cell. So that can be checked subcutaneously, intradermally. It's a little less uh, potent, but it will get the job done. However, if you want to go, if you want to take an existing LMP that is now optimized for a hepatocytic uh, delivery, and you want to go, let's say somewhere else, you want to target a cell in the spleen, in the bone marrow, in the lungs, um, there's, there are some evidences uh, for that. For example, there's a nice paper by Gons uh, et al. In, in Nature 2016, which very, those are people from BioNTech that used, uh, that showed that by simply adjusting the charge, uh, you can deliver a functional mRNA to, to cells um, in the lungs um, and in the spleen. And there's also some really nice work by uh, uh, the, the Dalman lab um, on, on barcoded nanoparticles, which also show that um, if you adjust, um, um, if you can charge, uh, adjust these particles, they will also end up in different organs and different types of cells than just hepatocytes. So the, the LMP platform was so much optimized for hepatocytic delivery, what I showed with the apparent PKA of, of between 6.2 and 6.5. Um, it's possible that to target other tissues and other cells, yeah, you, rather than base it on the existing LMP, you have to maybe screen and, and start from scratch with different uh, different design properties. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, our time is up, and um, I just wanted to, um, you know, thank uh, Roy again for being available to give this presentation on lipid nanoparticles for nucleic acid therapeutics and all the participants for um, putting um, the questions through the chat room. Uh, if you have any other questions, please address them directly either to Roy or via the uh, focus group and we will make sure those questions um, are sent or shared with Roy um, for him to provide uh, an answer. Yeah, you can, you can contact me directly. I'm, I'm pretty findable uh, online, Arby. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. For, uh, for hosting and thanks everyone for attending. I hope, to see you everyone. In, uh, I hope to see you all in Las Vegas. <laughs>